Well, good time of day again, everyone. <laughs> uh, let's welcome Mathieu Fair from the University of Edinburgh, who will be presenting to us IRDL, an IR definition language. Take it away. Hi. Hi. So today I'm going to present yeah, IRDL, which is an ODS-like dialect to define dialects at runtime in MLIR. So let's start a bit with a bit of motivation. So most of the time when you want to create your dialects in MLIR today, you use table gen with ODS, or you can even define it in C++. But there are some cases in which you would like to define dialects using, I don't know, let's say metaprogramming, or you want to define it from another language like Python, where you don't want to actually generate C++ or recompile it every time you make some change. So currently in MIR, there are some ways of doing this. So there's been this dynamic dialects or extensible dialects that allows you to define new operation attributes or types at runtime. The problem is this requires some extensive boilerplate code, which is exactly the same code you would have to write if you would be writing this in C++ directly without the use of ODS. So, and if you have ever looked at any of these files that is generated by ODS, it's a bit complex and it's not something that anyone wants to touch, I guess. So the goal of IDL is to provide an ODS-like way of defining those operation types, attributes, or dialects at runtime. So these four main points we want, I mean, four main features we want of IDL. The first one, we want it to be concise, something that is easily written by a human or easily read by a human. We want it to be introspectable in the sense that you can look how a definition of a dialect is constructed, which let's say how many operations you have in your dialect, what are the number of operand results, et cetera. And you may also, and you also want it to be dynamic. So this is the kind of main features, which is that you should be able to register them at runtime without needing recompilation. You also want it to be generable because we want to be able to generate IIDL directly. So we can use this, let's say, metaprogramming or using, I don't know, defining IIDL from Python directly, let's say. The main challenge here is that we need to rely kind of in a declarative specification of dialects and we cannot use C++ to save us whenever it is something we kind of can't express, or at least we should not rely heavily on C++. And the way of doing, of having all those features is exactly what a dialect is. It is something that is quite easily generable, introspectable, and also, um, yeah, that you can, uh, yeah. So I'm gonna show you a simple example of what you could have with IDL and which is let's say called the dialect C math for complex mathematics. So it's a dialect, essentially the definition of a dialect is a single operation, ideal the dialect, and you just give a name, which is the name you will have for your dialect. You can create new types, just kind of the same way you would in ODS, where you give the name of the type. So here it's complex, which represents a complex number, and it has a parameter, which you also have in ODS. It is, for instance, here we want a complex number of, the float, of a floating point type. We may define aliases, which are quite easy to abbreviate essentially long types or attributes. And then we can define operations kind of like ODS, but I'll go in more detail afterwards. But essentially here we, for instance, define an operation multiplication that, has, uh, that is generic over T. I'll go more in detail later. It has two operands that are type T and one result of type T, and it has a nice formatting for whenever you want to use it in an MLIR file. This format is kind of what you have in ODS currently. So the main features of having, I mean, the main benefit of using IIDL for this is that you could at runtime register dialect in MLIR and then define MLIR programs that use this CMAF. So for instance, here we define just a simple function taking two complex numbers as parameters and returning the multiplication of those two numbers. So I'll go a bit in detail in the kind of language specification of IDL and look what the kind of features we can have. So the main, I would say, feature of IDL is what we, I would call local constraints, which are constraints over types or attributes. 
So if let's say we define a type complex that has this single parameter element type, element type use a local constraint to express what are the constraints over this parameter. So here the constraint is that it is a float type. So what is this float type exactly? Well, we can build it in different way. So essentially these constraints represent local structure invariance and here are like kind of some examples. So for instance, we can have a constraint that is essentially inequality. So here, the, the new constraint, which is defined by an alias my i32, is defined by all types respecting the equality to i32. So essentially, it's only i32. You can define types using, uh, you can define constraints by look by essentially giving constraints on the parameters of a specific type constructor. So for instance, here, when we define complex, we can directly write complex of any to express that it's a complex number with any possible if that will match for any parameter. So it's the equivalent of is A in C++, for instance. We also have shorthands for this. So instead of writing explicitly all parameters with any, we can just not give any parameters. Or we can simply give more constraints on those parameters, for instance, here. We say it's a complex number that has F32 for parameter. So here it's a actually constraint that is also kind of an equality constraint because you're only checking that it is a complex of F32. We can also use other construct like any of, which checks that essentially it's a complex number of either F32 or F64. Or we can have more complex things with and and not to express essentially the constraint to those types. So here it's a complex number that is both a floating point type and also not an F32. So we can also build constraints by essentially defining them in other languages. So this is in the cases where you want to express more complex constraints that are not really easily definable using this kind of structural constraint. So here, for instance, we may define a uh, a constraint called myconst that is defined in C++. And the way we would define it in C++ is that we would give a closure where we have uh, as input a list of attributes, which would be the attributes for which we want to check the constraints. And then we would write, I don't know, arbitrary C++ code that we can then register in IDL. So here, essentially what's happening is that you will register once this constraint and then you can use it in any IDL file at runtime. So you pay the cost of defining these constraints once, but you don't, it doesn't require you to recompile it every time you're using it. It's only when you're defining it. And one of the, one of the nice thing with this is that nothing prevents us of providing, let's say a nice C API or Python API to define the same constraints in Python. So this means that if we want to, let's say use MLIR defined dialects in another language, we could do everything in that language without having to go back to C++. And in that case, we register this custom constraint at runtime as well. So we don't have to pay the cost of compiling C++. So I'll just need to take a note. Uh, this is kind of work in progress. This is not implemented, but this is something like we definitely plan to implement. And one of the reasons we didn't implement it yet is because we can ask this like, how do we exactly define those custom constraints? So here I provide an example where as argument of the custom constraint, we only have a list of attributes or list of types if we want. But what we maybe want to do is to define constraints that take as parameters numbers. Because let's say we have a case where we want to give, I don't know, let's say the number of bits of an integer you want to have or something. So should we use a custom parser for custom constraint or maybe we should we want to, on the custom constraint, give other constraints to nest again those constraints. So this is on the current open questions I have, and that would be maybe very interesting for discussion later on. So one of the other constraints you can have is constraints over types, over those parametric types, but that are not defined in IDL. So one of the kind of problem you have with these kind of things is that Let's say if you want to say I have a built-in dot complex type with a parameter t, where t we can, um, as usual, give arbitrary constraint type constraints on it. The question is, 
how do you define these things? Because in MLIR, types do not really have a name or do not really have a list of parameters that are easily introspectable. So the way we're currently doing this is that for each of type we want to use for on constraints, we need to provide a wrapper for it that is written in C++ that gives us the name of the type and that also give us the list of parameters it has that allow us to kind of introspect a C++ type. So one of the question would be, and yes, then yes, we can register it in IDL, meaning we also have to register it once to compile C++ once, so then we can use it on all IDL files without having to recompile again. So one of the question is, would could we have in like an embed and way in MIR to provide this information and to like introspect this information, we could think about extending sub-element type interface, which allows you to introspect um, types or introspect attributes that are nested in types or attributes. Or we could find about having this type, these complete these type wrappers defined using table gen or etc. This is something that would be very interesting to make this process a bit easier. So now that we defined constraints, we can show how to define types and attributes. So for types and attributes, essentially we define a list of parameters, which are all attributes or types. We define, we can define a little summary if we want to generate some documentation, and then we can define the format the same way we can define it in table gen. We also can define what's called constraint variables, which are kind of the equivalents in table gen in ODS than uh, same operands types or same operands and result types. Essentially here, we provide a generic parameter T that has the constraint float types. And we ask those parameters, which are float attributes, to have the same T for the types. So if we take a simple example, you can here so here this is a complex attribute which has essentially two values so here we can define a complex attribute that has both two f32 values which pass the verifier you can have the same thing for f64 but if you have a different type we would get an error at when we construct the type because the patterns are not equal which should be um, the case because of this constraint variable the same way you if we use a different constraint like let's say if we use something that doesn't validate this t constraint which is the float type thing then we will also get an error because the parameters do not satisfy this local constraint which is the t one so these constraint variables allow us to encode more things declaratively which i do not think is currently possible in ods and would prevent us to write this um, without using c plus plus so we have the same thing in operation definitions. We also have this constraint variable, but then in operation definition, we also define operand results. And as well, we have the, this format and the summary as well for documentation. And the format here allows us to actually look at in nested uh, types. So for instance, here, this T is a complex value and element type is the name of the parameter so we can easily access it. And we can thus use this nice formatting, which is kind of the same thing you have in ODS as well. So as well, it, this is work in progress. Uh, one of the things we would like to have as well is to be able to define traits and interfaces. And the way we would need to do this is that traits do not have names as well. So there's no way in MLIA to say, give me the trait with this name. And one way of doing this would be that as well, we take our IDL dialect and then we can register trait and interface. To register a trait, we just need to give the name and essentially it gives us kind of a function that allows us to, uh, the trait itself contains the function that allows to verify if our operation um, respects these traits or not. And then for the interface, we need to provide a pass function that essentially we pass this argument of the interface to generate the implementation of the interface. So this is so both traits and interface are things that are not supported in MLI kind of dynamically, in the sense that we cannot give uh, traits and interface to dynamic operations, dynamic types, and dynamic uh, attributes. 
So this is something that needs first to be implemented that way. And the challenge here also is how do we handle templated traits and interfaces? So some traits and interfaces depend on um, templated value in C++, which would not be possible here because we do not want to compile C++ again. And in the same way, traits can be dependent on others, which is encoded with static assert in C++, which we couldn't as well support. So we also need to think about those kind of challenges if we want to be able to implement those things. So now I presented IDL, which is kind of a concise dialect for defining dialects. But we can also use kind of another abstractions to do this. So our previous abstraction was essentially relying on attributes. So if we look at our multiplication operation again, this complex of any of our F32, F64 is encoded in a single big attribute. And the problem with this is that it's hard to um, kind of generate, optimize, or reason with those things. And one nice thing you could do is define all those constraints directly as operations. So in this case, each SSA value in our ideal SSA dialect correspond to a single um, type and attribute constraint and also correspond to a single type and attribute, which I'll go a bit later. So if we want to look at a translation, of our F32 constraint that we had before, which essentially stating that the type needs to be equal to F32 is translated to an East type operation in IDL SSA. Uh, F64 is translated to East type as well, or any of uses the SSA value to express that it's either uh, the type that is um, verified by a person zero or the type verified by person one. And our parametric type um, constraint definition is using the parametric type operation in IDL SSA with the parameter two, which was all any of. So I'll go a bit in detail now on how we can actually match types using this representation to know, which is useful to know if like, let's say an operation verifies or not with the gear, with the given types and attribute it has. So if we now take, a simple CMAF mole dot mole operation that we define with this ideal SSA operation. I'll show a bit how the, the verifier works. So the CMAF dot mole takes as two input two inputs with our CMAF dot complex and as output CMAF dot complex. Note that here in our definition of our operation, we have person three both in the two operands and in the result. This means that both that all three, op uh, that both two operands and the result need to have the same type. So if when we call the verifier, what's going to happen is that the first thing we want to do is check that cmaf.complex respect the local constraint we have on it. So this is the local constraint of LHS, which is this parametric type. The parametric type is a cmaf.complex, meaning that we kind of verify these parts of the constraint. So now we go one step deeper with this like person two. So now we need to check that F64 is satisfied by this any of. This any of is between person zero, person one. So the first case, so we, we first check the first case. So we check if it's equal to F32, it's not. So we go one step next in the any of, and we check if it's equal to F64, which is the case. So now what's happening is that each SSA value correspond to one type. So when we go one step next, when we finally succeeded in our any of, this any of now has the value F64. This means that anything in our current operation that will match this any of needs to be an F64, because that's how we check that there is equality between all, let's say, operands in that case. So now when we go back one step in our parametric type, parametric type is not the type cmap.complex f64. So in that case, we're done with our first operand. We finally matched this parametric type. So we go to the next one. And in the next one, we directly look at the value of person three because it's already defined. So we just check the equality, the equality between person three and this current type instead of going back 
into that type constraint again. It is the same in the result, and that's how we ensure that all operands and results all match the same type. So what is the kind of benefit of using ideal SSA? So what is the benefits of currently using IDL SSA? So one of them is to be able to write some optimization on our current verifiers. So when we generate IDL SSA from IDL as a lowering process, what we often get is kind of a repetition of some operation of some constraints. So in that case, let's say we have a parametric type, which is a CMAF complex of person two. We have three times the same operations. We know because parametric type is defined as a no side effect operation that this can be simplified into one single operation. And the reason we're allowed to do this in the first place is because the person three SSA value is directly defined when you have the, the value of person two. There is no kind of side effects at all. There's no, it's completely defined using person two. This is not the case for, let's say, person two itself, because this operation might be person zero, might be person one, depending on the type you are currently matching. So we have optimization for free using, let's say, CSC, but we also can write our own optimizations. Uh, if we take this definition in IDL or ODS-like language, we, are, we want to have a complex value that has as parameter either an F32 or an F64. When we kind of compile it or when we let's say, generate the verifier in MLI at runtime, what we get is we have a kind of costly operation, which is to look at the parameters of a cmaf.complex. So this returns essentially a small vector of parameters that we then want to check that the first parameter is respecting this constraint. So one optimization we can do is instead of having this complex of any of, we can essentially switch the two and have an any of of two complex. And the difference we get at runtime execution is that we have just a pointer equality and essentially we check first the any of and we just have two pointer equality at most instead of having to look in the, uh, in the parameters itself. The reason why you don't have to look the parameters itself there is that cmaf.complex of F32 is a single type. It's an is type and it's not a parametric type. So, I think Alexander, uh, a question. Yeah, oh, I yeah. have a question. Uh, so potentially you could have an operation that has two, um, I, like any of F32 and F64, but it not, would not be the same. Uh, you know, here here you said that basically yes. the two input has. So so then it's all strange because you both have um, the ISA type is the same. Do you have an S of any is also the same, but that is used in a different way. So I don't really know how the SSA works in, in this, but, but okay. maybe I just don't have enough understanding. Yeah. So um, let's say you have an operation that can take just two operands. Let's say it's a multiplication operation with two operands. And the operands are either F32 and or F64. If you have only one any of operation and you take its SSA value and use it for both cases, which is what we have here, then it, it has the meaning that both operands have the same type. However, let's say that this operation now allows to have heterogeneous multiplication where you can multiply an F32 uh, to an F64 then the difference you would get is that you have two any offs, one that we match the first operand, the second that we match the second operand. And the idea is that since they are different, they may have different types, which allows you for this heterogeneous computation. Does that make sense? Yeah, I agree. But it, it just feels like SSA typically you go from you know the top to the bottom. And I think here yeah. you do from the bottom to the top. So it feels like if you look mm. at the top to the bottom, it's it's the is type, the person zero, person one still work. However, here it's almost like as you go backwards, you get various different instances of the same, which feels like it defy a little bit, let's say. I, you know, it's it's not super important, but I, I'm it feels a little weird, I mean, to say the least. Yes, I understand. Uh, I think it makes sense. There's maybe another way of encoding this. And yeah, instead of going into that direction, 
we would more have like kind of an automata definition that is kind of backward. What the first operation would be, is this a parametric type and essentially have nested ifs in that case? Yeah, because I think mm. I agree because typically if, if two expression have the same inputs uh, and the same operation, and let's just say they by definition is the same and you don't have redundancy. And it feels like here you really defining the SSA uh, meaning because you, you interpret it in a different way. So that's why I'm just a little confused about the SSA types. I think you, you mean something similar, but not quite the same. Okay, yes. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. There's maybe another way of defining this, which is, yeah, because the thing is we have SSA, but we also have side effects that are kind of hidden in that way. So yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I think, I think your comment, Alex, is valid in the context of a side effect free, pure interpretation of an IR. Mm. Okay, yeah, my, my, my bad. Maybe my knowledge of SSA is from if way I, too old. If I, if I make a parallel maybe here, it reminds me of PDL versus the PDL interpreter, where PDL also has this same, you know, top-down definition, which is then matched in a bottom-up fashion, whereas the PDL interpreter is a more imperative compilation of this description. I don't know, Jeff, if you relate to, to this as well. Yeah. Also, as a note, uh, the way we define our constraints is very similar to what there is in PDL currently. They are kind of almost the same abstraction. The difference is that we have things like parametric type, et cetera. Uh, I see someone else has a question. I think Dan was next. Yes. Hello. I had a question about the next slide. Uh, yes. Uh, this one? Uh, the one after that, the one yeah. where you move the any of to the at the top level. Um, yes. One question is the conditions under which this optimization can be done. Mm -hmm. So it seems like you're doing some kind of reordering, but also something akin to generic specialization or instantiating the types, the parametric types. Mm -hmm. But on a previous slide, you showed complex of uh, something like any float type. So would it be possible to optimize that or is that not optimizable? So this is something we still need to think of, but from my understanding, if we have an any of, uh, if we have a parametric type of an any of, it is bad. Um, okay, so if we have an any of of is type, it is useful to nest the parametric type in the any of because they're going to get transformed into an east type. But there are some cases where, let's say, east type is um, an any, where this is not useful. So this is still work in progress. We haven't figured out yet what, in what cases is this always giving like good, better performances, and in what cases it is actually bad to do it. So yes, indeed, if you have both, let's say, 0 and 1, that are not that are like more complex constraints or things with like just any, then if we nest it, we actually lose performance, I think. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. I think there is also one complication with this optimization that you're showing on this yep. slide, which is not a decision you can do locally, if I understand correctly. You cannot just look at an any any of and do this transformation because it depends if the person zero and person one are used elsewhere. Because as uh, you showed before, like now the instance of every time yes. matters. And so in an operation, they could also be used in, for another operand. Right? Yes. So this works only if person zero and person one have a single use. I think it's this case. So there's many there's actually many optimization in ideal SSA that only works if you have a single use. No, I think Ryan had a question too. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, so I guess I was, uh, based on the, the first question, uh, at the very end we mentioned that there's some side effects uh, beyond the initial um, SSA, um, it's like the statement of it. I believe like the whole way that you get this feature of um, 
remember earlier we showed like if you use percent three multiple times, yeah. uh, you know, it binds it the first time, checks it the second time, um, which is inherently a side effect. Um, do you think that, I guess I was gonna ask on the, the slide we were just on, the I think the next one. Um, so when you use, um, can those like propagate to like one line having like two or three side effects? So for example, when you use uh, percent three, although you have to do this at runtime, that part I don't entirely understand, but when you do use percent three and it gets, I guess bound or defined as some type um, that will have a side effect on percent three. Will that line also have a side effect on percent two because now uh, percent two needs to actually be F32 or F64? Um, so essentially, the so in that example, the only operation that has a side effect is actually any of, because any of will choose either percent zero or percent one, depending on things that happens on red time. However, person three only depends on the value that person two got. So technically, okay. person three did not introduce any side effect. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So percent three isn't technically changing because it just it's dependent is changing, but it's not changing. Yes. Okay, and then uh, I had a bit of a technical, uh, maybe it was a, just a, an error on one of the two slides ago. Uh, the example of uh, binding, I wanted to ask. Um, so here, mm -hmm. um, if I understand correctly, the bang operator. Uh, makes it so that it doesn't have to be strictly the same type, just needs to be equality check, correct? Uh, um, which bang? Uh, so the exclamation point before cmath.complex in the bottom. Yes, um, so, so, so this when, is the mm -hmm. MLIR code. Yeah, and so the, yeah. okay, so am I correct in understanding that the types passed into cmath.mol just have to be equal to a cmath complex F64, whereas percent three says it has to be exactly uh, a cmath.complex of either F32 or F64, or is one of these have like an implicit equality that I don't, I don't understand? Oh, I guess so they're just a missing exclamation point. Uh, so the exclamation point here just states that this is a type. Oh, but okay. Why the code there block is below the... is MLIR code. Like, oh, okay. Yes. So, okay, got it. The, so the bottom one is MLIR, the top one is ideal. And yes, the oh, equality okay. comes from the fact that they all have person three. Got it. So how would you represent, um, I guess in MLI, you'd have to actually represent a specific type, not just something equal to a type. Okay. Um, okay, then. Thank you. Okay. I think that's it for now. Perfect. Is there any other question on the IDLSS site? I guess no. So, okay. So I'm going to just continue the last part. So, one thing that was quite, I mean, that is quite useful. So I've been talking about how we can kind of define dialects, but I've not talking what we can actually do with this IDL or IDL SSA thing. So one thing I've been doing is kind of analyzing the MLI dialect. So this is something that you can hardly do using table gen. So there are some things you can get easily, like the number of operands, number of results, but there are more complex things like, let's say, introspecting the, um, different kind of uh, constraints you have on your parameters. So what I've been doing is that I took some MLIR code with, I mean, some table gen code. I've written a semi-automatic translation, which is kind of writing a lot of regexes to handle kind of the cases you have in MLIR. And I did this to generate IDL files that I then automatically kind of analyze and get some nice graphs. So. I mean, one easy thing you can get is the number of operations, but that you can already do in table gen. You can look at the number of operands you would get. And let's say you can easily like analyze yeah, how many operands you get in each operation in MLI dialects. And you can see, yes, for instance, there's a lot of use of three operands in some of the dialects because they're like, I mean, that's how the dialects kind of the signature of dialects if you want. What you can look at is how many return types there is. And we can easily see, for instance, that there's rarely more than two return values in operations. So just note that this is the number of, oper uh, of result definitions and not the if they are variadic or not. This is, again, something different. And one thing that is mostly interesting, which you kind of can't do in table gen directly, is looking if you can represent all of these things at runtime. So I looked at all the verifiers you have in um, types in MLIR, and I looked if I can generate corresponding IDL code 
that do not require additional custom um, C++ constraint, as I show you, could define. And actually, most of them could be completely defined in IDL without the use of C++. So that's just kind of a way to prove, I would say, that IDL allows you to represent kind of many things without having to rely on custom constraints. Um, I did the same in, in for operations. And in that case, if you look at for each operand, the constraint you have on a single operand or a single result, you can mostly represent it in IDL, like 95% of the time. But the thing is, you have around 25% or 30% operations in MLIR that define an additional C++ verifier. So I haven't looked at it. Um, I, haven't, I haven't looked at each verifier to see if they make sense or not, but if you can represent them in IDL using this constraint variable thing that allows you to have generic, I mean, kind of equality between operands and results. But this is kind of an upper bound or a lower bound on the number of operations you could define in IDL that I currently use in MLIR. And this is just a bit to prove that it's usable in practice. So in conclusion, what we did with IDL is that we allow to generate MLIR dialects at runtime. So we can, in one side, get some introspection of them and look like, give some analysis on them. And also we hopefully can allow users to use other languages such as Python, for instance, to generate dialects so they can, let's say, more easily um, essentially test out their IDs rather than having to deal with stable gen, C++ compilation, and iterate a bit faster. And thanks. All right, well, thanks, Mathieu. Mm -hmm for the awesome presentation. Do we have any uh, lingering questions in our 17 remaining minutes together? Uh, Ryan? Uh, yes, to go back to the um, SSA side effect discussion, I guess just maybe a simple hacky kind of solution have you considered making it so that um, the side effects are explicit? So for example, if I pass in some type of if I have, maybe it makes it much more complicated, but if I have, you know, percent three and it's some any of, and then when I actually use it, it like binds or defines to one actual type, um, would it be possible to, in that statement that binds it, say actually percent three now generates a new SSA value. And then, you know, I can then use that later in the same line. You know, maybe that would be a lot, very difficult because you're, you could be defining a lot of, it's not really single assignment, like you're doing multiple uh, assignments in line or, I guess, have you considered ways to make the side effects more explicit or to um, kind of show that this is not just, you, you can't assume that the value won't like somehow internals of it won't change later? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't looked at all in, in these things. So, I mean, one way you could do is, I mean, to be honest, I kind of like looked how PDL kind of defined those things, which is this case, but I feel like passing like kind of, the effect every time would be kind of painful, I guess. I guess well, if, for example, if, if it were if you had like you know L LHS is percent three, RHS percent three, all those, and said if it were LHS is percent three, and when it binds, it becomes percent four, so that you know percent four is oh, actually the type it is, and then percent four would be so yeah. In this line, you would have percent three yielding percent four, and then like percent four percent four, but then you know maybe you'd have to. Um, have some type of way to determine oh is this type in any of or is this type of actually bound or like that would make it more complicated but that's just one way i see where you can make it explicit and someone sees this line they go oh there's a new percent here it's actually like causing some side effects and then yeah, that I see. yeah so i see that that kind of makes sense that's so um, the only problem i see is that so then lhs would have so either we have an operation that essentially is the only one that has side effect that choose, uh, let's say, value. Mm -hmm. And then every time that someone wants to, and for instance, LHS, RHS, res will take the result of this operation, which is kind of like the decision, and everything else would have no side effect. But then would it simplify the way we can write optimizations? That's what I'm thinking. And I that's... mean, for, 
So for example, if I was thinking earlier, I remember, I remember the three, four, five example where they were all actually the same any of that, um, that like, remember the, you said it was like one of the, it was a no cost optimization, but I believe that optimization, you have to first, you would have to check if three, four and five weren't all used. Like I think in maybe one or two slides uh, behind. Okay. Uh, I, I, if, I if three, yeah. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. for example, if, yeah. Oh, um, it's after, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I don't remember where it was, but I remember it was like three, four, and five. They were all equivalent statements of some any of, but you mm -hmm. could have them all bound to different ones. So you'd have where it's any of F32, F F64, but three is an F32, four, four is an F64, and five is not bound or used ever. Um, like in that case, in order to, to perform the optimization, you'd have to check that three and four weren't later on used, which kind of, I guess, goes against the point of SSA or makes it like, what's the, maybe we should make this more SSA-like. Um, so I can see that being a benefit where, you know, if you have this, there's some type of, in any of type never actually changes to become, if in my proposal or idea, in any of type would never actually change. Like if percent three isn't any of, it'll always be any of. When you use it, it will then, it can then generate, um, you can either like throw it away or whatever. Um, it can then generate a new type that's actually bound to like F32. So for example here, if percent two isn't any of F32 or F64, when you actually use it, um, percent two won't change, but you can generate a new percent three. And then maybe you can have some type of syntax for doing that. But that's one way I could see it where that way you can be certain that if you declare percent three as any of, way later in, the, in your code, you know, a thousand lines later, however much you're doing in this SSA, you can be sure that when you use percent three again, it's still that any of, which I guess is, would in my mind make it sound a lot more like what what I think SSA is like, but you know, what do I know about SSA? I don't know. That's just what I would think. Does that, that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think that should solve this problem, I think. Yeah, because that way, because I think when I come into this, i you know, I've only taken like one compiler class. I don't know much about it. I just assume, oh, mm -hmm. SSA, static meaning, you know, it's not going to change. But when you introduce like internals are changing and technically this, that, and the other thing is not changing. Um, it's like, oh, you know, I don't know if these are like, people will simplify their assumptions. So even though this might like match some mathematical definition of SSA, like if someone just assumes SSA means the value doesn't change, their definition of change might be really, really like broad. Um, so I think making that more explicit to the people reading the code helps. I think it can help with your note, like your optimizations, like, cause I think it's now that I'm thinking about it, I think the no cost optimizations earlier actually might incur a cost that you have to, like, I don't even know if those are possible to do. I don't, know, I don't know if you found the slide I was talking about, um, but place this before. Um, yes, this one, yeah. the, the, this slide. So I don't even know if this is a, like this redundant computation can actually be optimized out unless you then, like you could, obviously if you're gonna read the whole file, you can keep track of if three, four and five are used separately, but that's like adding extra cost. Whereas if you were to make this more explicit, um, sorry, someone I else is calling on my phone, but, so um, Long story short, I think you guys are getting what's, what's going on. Hmm. So in that case, uh, this optimization can always be run because this mm -hmm. is strictly no side effect. And even if these ones are used in different places, they always will mean the same type. So it's only in that um, case where this may be a bit complex. Uh, yes? If I actually don't change, um, like they're either not defined or defined. And so, uh, for example, if you look at three, because uh, you go back to the slide, here, three, four, and five will always uh, denote the same type because they depend on two uh, and they are transformed by a parametric type, which has no side effect because it's basically, if you if two is fixed, uh, then cmap.complex.2 is also fixed. And so that's why you can uh, translate it, you can remove four and five. So that means SSI values don't actually change. Like they just, it's just that you, they're uh, either you don't know what type they contain and then you end up knowing the type and then it's fixed and it will never change again okay i see your point there yeah i i still like have like if i were to read this i still still would have like issues with it where i don't like the I, i'm not sure exactly. two changes but i understand your point now i understand how you're saying this actually still can be three four and five or equal because yeah if three if you use three percent two becomes a type percent two becomes one of them and then 
that means four will become one of them as well by by definition i understand that now I mean, that's interesting. That was not obvious to me, at least at first, the way you're considering it. That means that an operation that would define three, four, five as operands, even though they are not the same SSA value, implicitly you consider them to be the same type. That's what you mean by your side effect, Mathieu? Yes, it's because three, four, and five, I mean, this operation only depends on the value of person two. So whatever happened, they will always denote the same type. Because the value of- By the way, I think if, if you've read some like the PDLL ones or PDL one, this actually feels quite natural. But you know, I, I agree, like the first time you look at it, it's sort of a little bit weird because it is effectively setting up a set of constraints before you go and actually uses it. So it is definitely different than, you know, um, I think if you think of these as like a set of constraints that gets added, 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 and refined, it feels a little bit more natural. You know, at least for me, like that, that's the more natural read to it. But sorry, I actually interrupted. Uh, Jake was going to hand it over to you. Alex, I think, was next. Yeah, Alex. Uh, yes, yes, I have an idea. Uh, no, I have a, a question, uh, especially concerning the which uh, like which. Um, dialect needed, uh, you know, custom operators. Uh, and I think what you showed is like when you have a more complex uh, dialect, typically, you know, higher level, uh, then yeah. they have more uh, constraints that must be written. So I'm, I'm not, I'm mostly familiar with uh, Onyx MLIR, which is like, a, you know, Onyx dialect, uh, and it's not part mm -hmm. of uh, MLIR directly, but I think there's probably very similar ones uh, that come from TensorFlow. One of the constraints we have often is that, you know, an input could have a, a rank, uh, and then mm -hmm. there's another input that uh, has to be, the value has to be constrained either within the rank or, you know, the minus of the rank, two plus the rank. So, so we have also often constraints that are of this sort. Uh, I wonder okay. if you, you can express them as well or, or not, because so, that, that would probably yeah. be interesting. So that's kind of what this slide was about, was we could represent custom constraint that just, we take a vector of attributes and then we express our constraint on it. Or maybe what we should do is each custom constraint defines kind of a parser that express what kind of arguments you can have. So in your case, you will have both, I guess, values, which are like the rank of your tensors and also the tensors themselves. The question is how to express this. It's still unclear, but that's exactly. kind of what I want to have. Exactly. So, so I'm not so interested in the mechanism, but I think that's, I just let you know that that's one of the constraints that we see often. Uh, another thing is like some of those complex operations may have a lot of um, simple constraints that could be expressed that way and some mm -hmm. others that are more complex. So it might be interesting and maybe you support this or not, but it might be interesting to have um, a, like a hybrid mode where you can express using your, your own language, you know, the simple ones. And then for specific, uh, you know, obscure constraints, we would be able to, to generate um, a C code version. So kind of a hybrid mode and maybe mm -hmm. you support it, maybe not, but that, that's something that would be of interest, I think. Nice. Uh, Min, did you have something to say? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so uh, so Alex just mentioned, uh, you know, what about uh, like even higher level dialects, but I have the opposite question. So uh, what, what, what if we can um, express something really low level, like an Elvian targets, like can we use this to replace uh, the, the current way to use table gen to define instruction infos? Like, because what, what I really like this idea is the introspectable. Like you have mm -hmm. the whole system of in-memory API to do much more flexible, like, you know, introspections compared to table genes. Um, so, you know, what's your thoughts on this? Uh, can we use this RDL to define um, like instruction definitions at least? Um, so I'm really not familiar with the LLVM part. So I'm not quite sure I can understand this, but Essentially, one thing that would be nice as well is that we can generate IDL, or at least generate IDL or IDL SSA. So maybe there's a way such that you can write your LLVM kind of specification in an easy way, and then generate this IDL that you can then introspect. 
the question oh, yeah, is yeah. no so th th that's that is definitely possible during the transitional uh, like era but what i'm thinking is like completely replacing uh, the, the current table gen definitions on instruction infos um, with these IRDLs. Um, because again, like this is more versatile and you have more freedoms mm -hmm. on defining. And of course, like replacing a lot of C++ code because you know more and more Elvin target is seeing uh, like code bloatings. Like uh, we invented table gen, but now we actually have much more C++ code than the table gen mm -hmm. codes. Uh, yeah. So you would mean generating C++ instead of declare, I mean, registering at runtime? No, no, so, so exactly what, what's your use case here, right? So, so, so here mm -hmm. you're using IRDL to def define custom operations that will, will, uh, will be um, you know, lifted or translated mm -hmm. into in-memory objects, then you can do whatever you want. So similar to um, you know, LVN targets, you, 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 you use this to define operations where, where each operation is actually uh, hardware instructions. Then after you lift it into in-memory object, you can translate it into you know instruction selector, instruction schedulers, or all kinds of you know um, uh, you can even write optimization passes. Um, uh, so it's the, the the same ideas, but now the operation each operation is actually a hardware instructions. Okay, so I want to say maybe, but the problem is I'm really not familiar with all these uh, LLVM parts, yeah, it, it, so it, I cannot give like a straight a answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is more like common because you know I really like the again the flexibility of these uh, mm. because like table gen is not bad like I've been working on table gen forever but it has some limitation especially the in memory APIs like table gen has in memory APIs but it's really parser like stuff like mm. it provides abstraction but not powerful enough um, and it doesn't have any way to do let's say writing the pass to transform those table gen in memory APIs uh, sorry in memory objects so. I really see some potential on this uh, frameworks. So I think this is really neat. Thanks. Thanks. Ryan, you still got your hand up? Oh yeah, I forgot to lower it, but I do, I just wanted to ask like about this um, work in progress, custom local constraints. Um, I. I guess I don't really understand the the shape of the problem as much because I haven't been on this side of uh, using it. But are are these kind of constraints usually just like simple parameters, or are there not real issues where you know you need to have um, different types of custom constraints, or as what uh, trying to understand like what's preventing you from kind of I, I think the this is what someone mentioned before the hybrid model, where I, if I understand correctly, you do some type of um, some simple uh, can, argumented constra uh, constraints, like he was saying with the you know rank is just two times this rank or something like that. Is that what you're talking about with the the hybrid? Or I don't really understand. I guess the problem. Can you kind of just briefly go over what the some of the issues are with this? So with the issues of, I mean, the reason why we need a custom constraints. Uh, the issues with what you don't know what arguments like what, yeah, uh, what's, yes. is it is it too is it that you don't know when you're trying to read is it like just that when i'm trying to read this custom like you know open bracket close bracket mm -hmm. braces it, it's hard for me i don't know at this moment whether this this custom constraint takes two parameters or four parameters or something like that or is it not possible to make them like to template the templating where um you know you have this keyword custom and it takes some type of template that tells you what kind of how many arguments it takes then it's like the name of the constraint something like that is is that the issue where you don't know what arguments to give it or is it something yeah. so at a different level the main question is what kind of arguments you want to give so i mean since all of these needs to be kind of registered from either c++ or another language what you may get is that so you, you may want to say oh you just expect a vector of attribute because all these constraints needs to have the same signature the question is, what will be the signature? Is it just a list of attributes? Is it a list of attributes plus some values? For instance, you want numbers. Sometimes you just want integers, like the rank of a tensor. Sometimes you want something more complex, which was like this example. You want to have actually constraint as your argument. So the big question so, is, yeah. I was going to ask, I guess, 
this is kind of what I was thinking earlier. Why do you need, do you absolutely need to have all the constraints have the same kind of parameters? Cause couldn't it be possible? So think about it, you have like a constraint, like I'm just thinking about it, like classes, right? You have a constraint class and then you could have like a, con a sub a child class with that that's constraints, but it takes these kinds of parameters or something where you in somehow embed the, t the information on what parameters it takes into the like static definition of what kind of constraint is this does that make sense i guess that is a lot more templating or gener genericization than it allows now but that's kind of what i was thinking where i mean maybe that's mixing c plus plus stuff too much but does that make sense yeah so that makes sense so if you would like if let's say you were just in a c plus plus world you would just define everything in c plus plus you could template create classes to whatever you want to have like the most i mean to specify in c plus plus your arguments the problem is if you did this from Python, you can't really template things. So you need kind of a generic way of getting those arguments. And that's why like one of the first idea I have is essentially when we give a constraint, we don't give the arguments it will get, we just give a parser. And the parser will essentially do whatever it wants to pass the different cons constraints you have. In that way, I mean, and of course you would give some C++ features. So you can give, let's say just uh, a closure with some, let's say you give two attributes and then it will check that there is only two attributes as argument or et cetera. But the idea is if you want it to be very generic and you don't want to rely too much on C++ templates, then you need, yeah, this generic way, which is probably just a custom parser, but that's a bit complex. So how does the custom parser know? I guess um, I don't understand how you're how you're passing it to it. So if, with the example where you want to give it the parameter like two or a number, mm. how does the custom parser capture that? Because you you specify the custom parser as a closer a closure in C plus yes. plus, and then it takes in attributes, but it might also take in some other type of. Okay, so then you don't know what kind of arguments it. Yeah, so you don't have to know which kind of arguments it has. You just want the parser to fail if you have wrong arguments. So in this specific case, your parser will just pass an integer, otherwise fail, and that's it. In this case, it will pass a constraint parameter, like a type constraint or an attribute constraint. So that's the difficulty here. We need to figure out like an API to be able to pass ideal constructs already. And yeah, that's mostly it. OK, I see. Yeah, this is a complicated problem. God, thank you for explaining. Well, uh, thank you, Matteo. That, that was a really awesome presentation. Um, I'll probably just leave with like one, one thing. You know, like I, I'd really be interested in like the the, the uh, IRDL to ODS and back mm -hmm. kind of mapping to semi automatic. I think that's actually a very nice experiment. Um, and I think even some of the ones we've seen, like this, some of the custom constraints we've had, um, you've identified. I think some of them may actually just be missing things that we actually need to um, raise up to more general concepts. I mean, even in ODS side. So I think that's actually very useful, um, you know, and I think it, it's, you know, it would be very useful to actually perhaps go through those in a little bit more detail. Um, but, you know, just in, uh, to respect everybody's time, you know, um, I think let, let's continue the, the remainder of this conversation more on the, the discourse side. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think this is very exciting. And, you know, I think it's definitely very nice. I mean, we've uh, kept, the, the ODS side reasonably constrained, um, you know, with the intention that, you know, at some point we may out outgrow it. So, I, I, you know, it's very interesting, especially to see like the parts which is already covered, the parts that are gaps and how these systems can evolve. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, you know, I thank you very much for the presentation and, you know, looking forward to carry this conversation forward on the forums as well as email. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.